Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Svetlana Mincheva, and I'm one of the co-editors and also a contributor to the book we're celebrating today. Um, welcome to everybody who's joining us to the virtual book launch, both on uh, Zoom and on Facebook. Um, we are celebrating Curating Under Pressure, International Perspectives on Negotiating Conflict and Upholding Integrity. I hope you have a drink in hand. It might be coffee because we are in very different time zones. Um, and I don't want to encourage drinking before noon, but this is after all a celebration. And it's a celebration of the work of our very, very patient contributors. Some of them are on stage, others are in the audience. Thank you all for coming. Uh, but this is also a celebration of the resilience of curators worldwide who do their work in often very difficult circumstances, uh, who ensure that artists have a voice and that the public can engage in ideas no matter how controversial they may be. And big thanks for our, to our contributors and thank you the National Coalition Against Censorship, my home organization, for hosting this event and Rebecca Little for ensuring everything goes smoothly behind the scenes. Uh, finally, big thanks to Janet Marston, my partner in this particular endeavor, endlessly responsive and patient and supportive. Thank you, Janet. Um, so as a reminder, this is being recorded. It's uh, both on Zoom and on Facebook, and you will you'll be able to see it on Facebook Live recorded later, uh, as well as on our website because it's recorded on Zoom. Um, please feel free to add your comments, questions um, on, in the chat. We're going to be monitoring the chat uh, to the extent of our capacities. We're going to address your questions. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll try to integrate uh, this whole discussion together. Um, I haven't moderated a virtual discussion uh, yet, and this is my first time, so bear with me. Uh, and with this, I'd like to um, give the floor to uh, my co-editor, Janet Marston, to talk about the book and her investment in it. <laughs> so my thanks also go to Svetlana for being such a fantastic partner and for introducing me to a side of things that I hadn't really thought about before. Um, I think we work great as a team. Also thanks to Routledge specifically to Heidi Lowther, our fantastic editor, and also to, uh, to our series editors, Richard Sandell and Christina Kreps, who were absolutely superb in the way that they guided us through the process. Um, Curating Under Pressure is a 14 chapter edited book with analysis from a wide range of international perspectives, some of which you'll hear from today, and dedicated to the subject of curatorial self-censorship. It argues that practitioners face a wide range of pressures to self-censor from every uh, side of the political spectrum. And negotiating these pressures requires uh, ethical uh, decision-making. It requires uh, um, a lot of uh, very difficult deliberation. It requires, uh, uh, it requires a creativity. And um, it also requires resilience over the long run. And this is particularly important now as museums recognize their role, increasingly recognize their role in civil society by providing a space to engage with difficult issues. Uh, personally, I was drawn to this subject in particular because of my, my interest and expertise in museum ethics. And I see this area as a particularly important aspect of museum ethics. But also, I felt compelled to write on the topic because I felt that the conventional dialectic between freedom of speech and suppression was insufficient to capture what was really happening on the ground for practitioners today. And this is something that was cemented, I think, um, certainly in the Anglo-American discourse in the first culture wars of the late 80s and early 90s. But in fact, it's a much more complex phenomenon than that. 
and um, it doesn't really serve practitioners well in these times. So um, my own research took me then to Hong Kong and particularly um, I was driven by one comment by someone that I interviewed, a, an artist and curator that I interviewed, who said to me that she wanted to learn the, she used the word craftsmanship of negotiating the pressures of self-censorship. Um, and I was really struck by that comment, how that could be seen as a kind of a craftsmanship um, uh, of dealing with all of these pressures. And I'm hoping that the book and also that our session today um, identify some common ground for knowledge exchange and mutual support and advocacy around this kind of craftsmanship. In the book, we define censorship broadly as a kind of suppression of ideas and artistic work um, uh, by any entity that has the power to do so. And this is traditionally um, uh, thought to be the state. But uh, more recently, um, particularly in uh, neoliberal societies, neoliberal economies, this also can be private entities. And sometimes even more power is asserted by private entities than by the state. But we define self-censorship then as the suppression of uh, ideas or artistic expression by an individual during the creative process or by the institution during the curatorial process. And one difficult thing is that it can be very subtle. It can happen during those very kind of ordinary aspects of uh, artistic or curatorial decision-making. So sometimes it's hard to even recognize or know when that self-censorship is taking place. And because it's hard to, if you can't recognize it, then it's really hard to fight it. Um, or to decide that, in fact, it's okay to do it, because sometimes we might think it's ethical to engage in self-censorship, but it's important to be engaged in deliberative decision-making about that. And, um, and because of uh, my ideas about, uh, about these issues, I then began to think that, um, that we need to rethink our notion of curating um, entirely in this way to, to include these ideas um, of, uh, to rethink the curatorial remit so that, um, so that negotiating the pressures of self-censorship become part of the toolkit that every curator, and in fact, not just curators, but museum directors, educators, um, <clears throat> and lots of other practitioners, artists and other practitioners as well, um, feel confident about and can work with their peers on. So um, as, uh, as the book and as our panels today will describe for you, self-censorship is recognizable by its primary motive, which is fear. Um, and that fear can come in many forms, can be created many forms. Maybe it's the threat of loss of audience or the threat of uh, a loss of funding or uh, reprisal from an authoritarian state. <clears throat> um, but what's, what else is really interesting about this is the slipperiness so that sometimes what might be an act of self-censorship by an institution, for example, let's say a board of trustees, uh, makes a decision to self-censor a project to the curator that was leading on the project that might feel very much like an act of censorship. So these terms are very slippery and it's really important to think through what they mean for all of us. In the book, we have two separate but overlapping sections that structure it. Uh, part one interrogates the silences around self-censorship to help us to recognize and understand the phenomenon. And part two primarily focuses on negotiating, on the strategies and tactics to negotiate uh, this phenomenon. 
And uh, in our panel today, and also in our audience, we have uh, um, uh, people that will speak to both of those things. So I'll hand it back over to you now, Svetlana. Thanks, Janet. This was, I think, I, I hope that that uh, whetted your interest in, uh, in reading the book. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how I came to it. And I've been working uh, on art censorship, I now realize, for this entire century, uh, this century, the 21st one. I started doing this in 2000. Um, and I've been working as an activist uh, involved in censorship controversies. And very early on, it was pointed out to me that the real problem is not so much censorship coming from without, but self-censorship. Um, and, and people were asking me, so what are you doing about that? What am I going to do about that? Uh, when it's something that, as Janet pointed out, is, is hard to identify, it's hard to even talk about, uh, people don't want to admit it. Um, and uh, on the other hand, censorship, especially on the institutional level, very frequently looks like downright censorship to the artists involved. Uh, and yes, there is self-censorship and there is a lot of fear in the field. Art institutions are embattled in different ways in different countries. I've been working um, in the US primarily and that's my perspective, um, but I know that uh, it's even worse elsewhere. In the US, they were embattled in the wake of the 1990s culture wars by facing threats to um, funding. Uh, they're embattled today with much actually harder questions about uh, uh, art institutions entanglement in uh, existing structures of power. And in those battles, much is at stake for a curator or a musician or a museum director. Um, and when we talk about censorship, we mostly talk about the artist who emerges often, um, even though they pay a price, they emerge often as a free speech hero in, uh, in an art controversy. The curator could, is behind the scenes, but she could lose her job. The institution could lose its funding, but there's a lot at stake. Uh, but at, uh, on the other hand, the kind of the, the visibility of curator is, is low, even though they're the, sometimes the real hero in those controversies. Um, so going back to the question, what can I do about it? Because that was bothering me, you know, there is self-censorship. Uh, and, you know, the one answer is not to say, tell people, oh, just be strong face the risks and take the consequences. So what I've tried to do is, uh, besides providing uh, direct support to curators, is to help them become smart risk takers. So which means to take some risks to maintain the integrity of their vision, but do it in a way that is smart and creative and flexible. And what that often entails is a process of listening, of negotiation and response. Um, and in my work with the National Coalition Against Censorship, I have um, worked to give curators opportunities to share expertise between, uh, between them uh, as to how to, to do this, because this is not what they teach you in curatorial programs, and this is what you face in the real world. And uh, curating under pressure is a continuation of that effort, engaging a much more international um, group of curators. Uh, and it tackles that question, how curators around the world deal with multiple visible and invisible pressures they face in their work. Uh, and kind of I'm proud that this is both an academic book, but it's a book that's written by practitioners mostly in the field, people that are on the front line actually doing the work, not just writing about it. So they're both, they're analyzing it and doing it. And um, I think that kind of makes it uh, uniquely great. Uh, and it is designed to help curators and um, help with curatorial programs. And since, it, since Curating Under Pressure went into print this year, uh, it's, become, it's become even more relevant um, with what has been going on, especially you know, from my perspective uh, in the US. Uh, we have had um, so many controversies around potentially painful material uh, that is exhibited. Um, for instance, we had a, there was a show in March that was um, 
canceled just before the COVID lockdown started in Cleveland in the Museum of Contemporary Art. And it was a show by um, Afro-Latino uh, artist, Sean Leonardo, which represented, it, um, it was, uh, his work is based on media images of police violence against, um, against black and brown men and boys. And some people in the community told them, in the black community in Cleveland, told the museum director, no, this is too painful for us. This is re-traumatizing. So um, she decided to cancel the exhibition as a gesture towards that community. However, a few months later, after George Floyd and the protests exploded, there was this question why she actually, she censored um, a conversation about one of the most timely issues in our time. So what she, what she kind of, the error she made is having, she listened to a part of the community speak for the whole community and the part does not always represent the whole. But this is a process and this is a museum director with 24 years of experience who I have a lot of respect for, but it's something that you know you keep on learning. Um, and then just this month, we had uh, the case where um, very prominent in the art world in um, the US and the UK, uh, where four very prominent museums um, in, the, in the United States and the, and the UK, the Tate, decided to postpone for 2024 a show by uh, a Philip Guston's work because of its uh, working with um, images of the KKK that were that would resonate uh, strongly in the present environment. Um, in a statement the, by the directors of those museums, um, they justified the postponement as, um, as an issue of timing. They said, we are postponing the exhibition until a time which we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice that is at the center of Guston's work can be more clearly interpreted. Which raises the question, why, when, if not now? This is the time when we're talking about this. Uh, which all leads me to um, our first question, which is about timeliness and the right time. How does, uh, how does the, the question of the proper time relate to your uh, work now and uh, in the past? And uh, what, what do you even understand by this concept of the proper time and who decides it? Um, who tells you what the uh, proper time is? And um, as, uh, as you are addressing this question, could you please also um, introduce yourselves in very, very brief terms as to who you are and where you are, where you're now and what you're doing. I think Candice. Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Candice Allison. I currently direct the Bag Factory Artist Studios in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm a PhD candidate in the history departments at the University of the Western Cape. Um, where I'm researching curatorial ethics. And first of all, thank you Svetlana and Janet for your patience and care in shaping my contribution to this book and for the invitation to speak today on the panel. And the text that I wrote deals with an exhibition I co-curated titled Our Lady, um, which took place at Itiko South African National Gallery. It was presented in partnership with the New Church museum, a private museum where I was a curator at the time, and it is no longer operational. And the curatorial team represented both institutions, and we aim to critique patriarchal representations of women, but there were two, I mean, there were many criticisms, but two main criticisms leveled at the exhibition for including a work by Zuleta and Tetwa, who at the time was standing trial for murdering a sex worker and the low percentage of women and black artists that we included in the exhibition. And the context in which the exhibition opened was at the height of student protests calling for decolonization of South African universities, which eventually led to the physical destruction of artworks. Um, Mteto's trial had been dragging on for two years after multiple postponements amidst ongoing, ongoing public frustration 
with the high rate of gender-based violence in South Africa. Um, so I could argue that it was not the proper time for the exhibition, but in retrospect, this is only partially true um, because what really happened is that the curatorial team and the partner institutions were simply unprepared for the intensity of the criticism that we faced and we were caught off guard. So we had not given sufficient weight um, to the importance of rigorous interpretation and we didn't communicate sufficiently with our audience um, about the internal discussions, deliberations, about the curatorial dilemmas that we faced in curating the exhibition. Um, and if we had done those things, and if the two institutions had a clear policy and plan for managing controversy, which they didn't, the partnership and the exhibition might not have dissolved within just two weeks after the backlash started. Um, I compare this to an exhibition I curated a year later, um, when I had a completely different experience. It was Good and I Rise solar exhibition at the National Gallery of Zimbabwe. And in South Africa, we have a lot of freedom to critique our government. I'm sure freedom that other speakers on the panel don't have. And things are very different in Zimbabwe as well. So we knew that we had to be more subtle in how we interpreted the socio-political content of the artist's work. And we chose to cover uh, a period of Zimbabwe's history from colonialism through the liberation struggle up to independence. And we called the exhibition we need new names after the book by Navale Bulawayo. And a week after the exhibition opened, a coup took place in Zimbabwe. And some of the images of the liberation struggle we had included in the show became extremely powerful as they resembled images of protest against Robert Mugabe that appeared in media reports and on social media and opened up a conversation that Zimbabweans were ready to have. So by complete chance, that exhibition really did take place at the proper time. But that was not sought. It was, it no, just happened. not at all. And um, I would say we did practice um, smart self-censorship in curating the exhibition, um, which was a reflection of everyday life in Zimbabwe at the time, which was to not talk about what's happening. Um, and it opened up the conversation or opened up the space for people to finally have that conversation. I really like this term, smart self-censorship. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that and what you think that means? Yeah, so um, I'm familiar with the National Gallery of Zimbabwe. I've worked there quite a lot. And I know that the gallery has experienced direct censorship in the past from government. So their um, gallery in Bulawayo was a part of the gallery was shut down, cordoned off. It was an exhibit in a crime scene for close on five years because of work that an artist had done criticizing Robert Mugabe. And so we knew that we couldn't take uh, risks that would put the artist at risk, the institution, close off the space for the audience. And so we decided to comment on the current moment by not depicting it at all. So we depicted everything up until liberation, and then we left it open for the audience to decide if liberation had really been achieved. So let, let's go around so that like everybody's um, on them. Christina? Hello everyone and good day. Um, I'm a curator first and foremost and currently I work at uh, the Museo de Bogota, which is a governmental run institution in Colombia's capital. And the um, chapter that I wrote has to do with my very deep and personal experience when um, I was coordinating the museology team at the Memory Museum of Colombia. And I'm happy to see amongst the um, people who are attending this event, people that I worked with in this project and people that have heard me speak about it and have accompanied me in many different texts. So I'm happy to see them here. 
um, the um, this writing this particular chapter um, meant uh, it was part of a closing process because um, and I want to obviously thank Janet and Svetlana for inviting me to do this. It was kind of, you know, part of psychotherapy as I was leaving um, this very challenging and difficult post. Um, I had the opportunity to write about what had happened and uh, what we had created and the failures and the successes about our project. Um, the exhibit that I um, take as a case study um, was the first exhibit of this museum, which was created by the Law for Victims and Land, um, la sorry, land Restitution. Um, I won't go into the details, but Colombia has had a, an ongoing armed conflict for at least six decades. Um, so the um, issue that I reflect upon is our challenges and finally our self-censorship concerning the representation of perpetrators and responsible parties in such conflict. I won't go into detail so that you can um, be excited about reading this chapter, um, but I will say that I try to examine the different tensions that the team um, and myself had to go through to make the final decisions um, as to how to portray them in this first exhibition. So in thinking about this issue of the proper, the proper time, I also um, think about my first experience when I came back to Colombia after having finished, having finished my pre-grad and the, um, that was 20 years ago, and the context for talking about or representing perpetrators in museums was very different back then, and it's different now in 2020, um, even just a couple of years after that inauguration that I uh, discuss um, was put, was, was made public, because we now have a new transitional justice system that has been at work for two years. So looking at issues of, of representation and self-censorship amidst societies in conflict kind of gives you, it mirrors the political context that curators and practitioners are living in. Um, so I would, I would have to say that uh, when confronting these political contexts, obviously one has to become, and I'm not saying that I am politically savvy, but definitely, um, as it is said in the book, uh, being able to develop this acute awareness to read what, what is going on. And also to read how in most societies that are in conflict, we have divided societies. And in Colombia, um, that happens as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about the proper time that I, I find it, it's such, a, it's such a great question that I probably did not answer, is when is it a proper time for the curator? Because had I, you know, had I faced this challenge that I faced between 2016 and 2018, had I confronted that challenge, I don't know, 10 years earlier, um, I probably wouldn't have had the tools uh, the team and the sort of the experience um, to have resolved it in a way that I thought at the time was, uh, was I think we made the decisions that we had to make at the time, knowing that, that those particular issues would have to be confronted um, as we developed a museum. Um, as an ongoing process and not just as the final product. Thank you, Christina. So, uh, Özge, the proper time, how does that resonate for you? I also wanted to start by thanking um, you, Svetlana and Janet, for the invitation. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Özge. Um, I'm a curator and writer from Istanbul, from Turkey, and um, I currently live in Hong Kong, 
And I work as the, the public programs lead at Asia Art Archive, which is a not-profit organization that does research, archiving, and programming around recent art in Asia. Um, the, the chapter that I wrote for Curating Under Pressure um, looks at several, several case studies from Turkey. Um, some of them are legal cases, some of them are cases about how curators negotiate interventions by non-state actors. So, um, and it's based on the, the interviews that I conducted in the last five years or so. And in this sense, it's different from Candice's and Christina's contribution because I um, look at the, the cases that I researched, uh, but I was not directly involved in the negotiations when the interventions happened. And going back to the question of proper time, uh, perhaps I can briefly speak about um, one of the, the case studies that I, I discussed in the, the chapter. It was around four years ago when um, a private art center in Istanbul canceled a group exhibition only five days before it was due to open. Um, the exhibition was dealing with the concept of war. It was curated by Katya Krupanikova. And I have to say that this was a time when they were a series of major bomb attacks um, against civilians in the country. So it was a period of mourning. Um, and they were also frequent attacks around the police and the, against the police and the military at the same time. So it's against this background that the, the organization announced their decision of cancellation, saying that it was not the proper time. Um, at that time, there was a lot of anger around the, against the institution. And for so many people, it was very straightforward. Everyone had to, to call it out. The institution had made a one-sided decision that it was not a proper time, and this was censorship. So um, there were more accusations than discussions, I could say. And what I would like to, to emphasize is that in situations like this, I believe that one of the most hopeful things and helpful things is to, to ask the institution about the risk assessment. Um, in this case, there was a letter sent to the institution by a group of organizations such as um, Siahband, the Black Ribbon, and one of the co-founders, Pelin Basharan, is in the audience today. And the, the letter asked two things. The first one was, how did they estimate the risk of the artworks on display? And second, whether they would consider hosting the exhibition again if the political situation improved. Um, there was no official response from the institution, but I don't think that it's important in this case because the, the letter was a precedent for many of us, many artists and many curators. And I believe that this type of attitude is very much needed if we want to improve our own questions to, to hold the institutions accountable for their decision when they decide that it's not necessarily a proper time. So maybe I'll stop here ask a question how does this how does this experience affect your work at the asian art archives um of course it affects my experience in major ways because um as you all know hong kong is not going through um an easy time in the last couple of years um i believe that the one of the, the contribution that I, one of the contributions that I'm able to, to make is actually to, to ask those questions as well uh, within the institution because I part uh, I work as part of an institution right now. Um, the, the question of um, the risk assessment is a, is a major one that I can basically delve more into um, in the, the coming minutes of the conversation. But it's definitely very relevant for this time in Hong Kong. And Jack, the proper time. Yeah. Um, hi, first uh, to everyone. Uh, thank you, Svetlana and Janet, uh, for including me in your wonderful project. Um, so my name is Jack Pasekin, and I live in Jerusalem. I work at the El Mamel Foundation for Contemporary Art, and I also uh, work on my own art projects. Um, my contribution to this book um, was basically um, self-reflection uh, on uh, the experience that I've uh, amassed over the years working in different places, particularly here in, in this country, but also abroad, primarily in the Gulf. And um, the lessons I've learned, um, I've um, 
I had a good thought when when I was asked to write this piece because I was thinking about the all the tactics and negotiations and and considerations and cost contextualization of everything one does in order to come up with something that makes sense and something that is um, intelligent and uh, meaningful yet of course avoid the fee i mean avoid the threats uh, that surround uh, uh, one's personal work and practice but also the institution that one uh, works for or help build and uh, the people who one works with, so primarily the artists. Um, and um, I'm thinking about my job and all the creators' job is first and foremost to primarily provide the right um, proper, and uh, I want to get to your proper timing, so proper environment, I would say, for the artists to, to, to produce and present their work. Yet at the same time, you know, put that in context and make sense out of it and um, dealing with issues of sexuality politics religion uh, in places like here and the gulf is no easy task and is very 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 difficult and you know i mean i'm not gonna go into the whole different examples of what i did and what i didn't do in the in the with the artists, uh, but these are landmines, and and you all know that uh, in in Sharjah uh, a landmine blew up in my face, and it wasn't under my control, wasn't my choice, wasn't my work even. I was the director, but somehow you know uh, one needs to also um, carry with the job the responsibility and the consequences. Um, so my piece is, is basically a set of advices. I mean, a set of, you know, um, ideas to think about, issues to consider, um, 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 structures um, to, um, uh, to even think about when one is setting up a project or institution. Because I, I personally had, uh, was privileged to be involved in setting up several institutions along my career. So that is also kind of very hard because one is actually um, tending to this very fragile entity that is growing up and trying to kind of set roots and, and find its way. Yet at the same time, is trying to also negotiate all these pressures uh trying to cater to the to its beneficiaries to to the artists themselves to its uh, audience but also uh to the funders and the government and the uh, and everything else so um it it's not and it wasn't to me about the proper time and then proper i would even qualify a little bit uh, it was more about the context and uh What's the proper context that one needs to basically uh, provide to cushion uh, the, the the work that is presented and the ideas that are presented? And actually, kind of following up on that, um, the, the context, the kind of this complex environment where you know, even if it's the proper time for. For in one aspect, it's not the proper time. In another aspect, then you know, around the Philip Guston show, there are a lot of there are, uh, many uh, very conflicted opinions of what whether it is the proper time or not. So, by uh, I'd say, like when you have this complex context of various people and various interests, how do you um, how do you define your responsibility? Who are you responsible to? Because it's you know, on the one hand, we we have now we have protests, we have, you know, um, people that want social justice, you have the artwork itself, and there is a certain responsibility that a curator has to the artwork, to the artists, also to the institution, you need to keep the institution alive, right? Um, so where, uh, how do you prioritize and how do you um, manage, who are you responsible to? Um, the community, the institution, the artists, 
all of the above and how do you, uh, you, you need to prioritize when there's a conflict between those? Like in your, just in your experience, how have you prioritized the various, the various responsibilities, sometimes conflicting, that a curator has? Um. I didn't mean it necessarily for you, Jack, but you can start if you because I think it was a follow-up of what you were saying. Yeah. Well, I, I saw this question and I, I also thought about it a lot. And again, you're, you're actually dealing with the universe of, of different uh, um, components and elements. And uh, in the universe you have, uh, you know, um, smaller stars and bigger stars you have you know smaller bodies of influence and 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 bigger structures of power that you need to deal with you have the artists and the ideas and the and the um, uh, and your audience that you actually uh, were set up to serve first uh, in the first place but yet in in the back office you're you're thinking about again the government and the funding and the uh, uh traditions and customs and and all of that um i think there are there needs to be uh, a set of principles uh maybe as janet said uh, ethics a set of you know uh, ethical standards that one needs to uh, um, have for herself for himself to be able to kind of be at service of the artist, the audience, the community, uh, be part of the community, but yet at the same time, deal like any other entity or even a household where you take the right measures in order not to kind of subject yourself to any threats from the outside. So, and this is what I tried to maybe in my, in my piece say, um, maybe sometimes you need to do to have a certain measure of self-censorship you know of what to say and what not to say uh, um, and and how to say it i don't know if maybe candace wa wants to kind of uh, because i saw her you know open unmute and then mute <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I agree with what you're saying, and that's the ethical binary or one of the biggest ethical dilemmas um, for curators is that they're all equally important, but you cannot give each equal importance in every situation. And um, yeah, I've had the opportunity to work in different contexts and these responsibilities are always shifting. So. Currently, as the director of an arts organization, which is created to serve and support the development of artists, my responsibility is, first of all, as the director towards the institution, then to the artists and to our funders and partners. And the nature of our space requires a responsibility to artistic practice and process over artwork. Then working as an independent curator, you also feel a responsibility towards the institution which has hired you. But as an outsider, you have greater freedom or opportunity to pro problematize or critique the institution, if, especially if they're open to this. Um, when I collaborate with artists, I'm most responsible to them. And this can be tricky, as in the case of the National Gallery, where I was equally responsible to the artists, the institution, the audience during a complex and heightened political moment. And I think in these instances, um, transparent dialogue and decision making are key to the success of a project. And that's what I talk about in the text where Our Lady failed because communication and decision making was not transparent um, between the partner institutions, between the institutions and the curatorial team, and ultimately with the audience. So there was no trust or solidarity and re relationships broke down as a result. I would, sure. oh. yeah. um, I would venture also saying that uh, there's a responsibility. I mean, this one is even more murkier, but there's a 
responsibility towards society. For me, it would be above the artist, above the institution, above specific communities. It would be what what is the what is the project or the institutions. Uh, aims, objectives uh, in terms of what it plans or what its, or what its role is in society. Um, I was just trying to figure out how to, because I understand that all of these constituents are important, but then as Candace was saying, when, when, when confronted with difficult situations, then one of them will have a greater impact than the others. Um, so I was wondering if the question can be, okay, if we're, for instance, in our case, our responsibility was towards victims of armed conflict, but it was also towards society um, at large in terms of um, our aim of transforming um, the cultural, um, let's say prejudices and ideas that naturalize violence. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. So yeah, I mean, I think it's always like we, we, we have all these responsibilities, but at some point they come into conflict and you have to prioritize. You can't, you can't uh, satisfy every requirement. You cannot you know, keep the institution safe and be, um, uh, keep the artistic integrity of the work and respond to community pressures coming from different communities. You just can't do that. At some point you have to compromise and make a decision and prioritize something. And I'm wondering kind of like, you know, maybe as again in what you've uh, witnessed or in your own practice, has there been a moment when you have to make a, a difficult decision and prioritize one over another? Um, I would, I would basically give an example from um, the, the research because I'm, I'm also thinking about the, the very difficult decisions that I had to make. Uh, but I believe the, the examples that I looked at in the conversations that I had with other curators and artists, they were much more difficult than the ones that I experienced. But I have to say that um, in these conversations, there was always this black and white situation. Um, one group would, would say that we have to fight for artistic freedom at any cost and institutions should always take the, the risk to, to show artworks, um, you know, quote unquote sensitive artworks, even if they lose their space, or even if they lose their collection or even if they lose their funds. And there was always this another group that, um, that, that said that the institutions are responsible to a larger public and they have to do whatever they can to sustain themselves because they need to survive. It's for the, the public because they're responsible um, for this larger constituency. And for me, the, the difficulty that I had um, is not specific to a particular situation, but it's very specific to, to this dichotomy, to this ethos around the artist as the, the ultimate author or the, the ultimate public figure and the, the ethos around the institution as the, the sovereign. It has to be there, you know, there is no other option. Um, I'm aware that this is not a direct uh, answer to, to your question, but I guess the, the thing that I'm trying to, to ask is how do we move beyond that? How do, we, um, how do we think about risk? And when there's a risk to, when there's a risk to take, how do we actually take the risk together? And how do we think about the exhibitions as spaces of negotiation? And I know that these are all beautiful words, but I guess you know one of the difficulties is actually the scale of the organization because that type of negotiations and that type of conversations, I don't believe that um, there is space for them in larger scale organizations. So that's something that I just wanted to throw to the table as in well. Sense, there's no space for them in larger, because larger organizations just can't afford to have those conversations? <laughs> I think in terms of the, um, Working with the, the artists in terms of the um, the number of the, the stakeholders in terms of the different voices that type of intimate conversations where we can say that let's compromise on each other's position um, and let's think about the um, the risks that we can all take together and I don't believe that um, that type of conversations can happen 
in uh, larger scale exhibitions where you're dealing with so many people to create, um, create a big exhibition, for instance. And I think, in, I mean, especially in the U.S., larger institutions are so, um, they, they really are money dependent. So you cannot, you, you just, they're, they're so expensive. You can't risk your funding streams because you have to keep a very large institution alive. So how do you, uh, you become much more, um, and that's what we've heard from curators, you become much more risk averse uh, because you're just, um, you, you just need uh, the, the funding streams. And uh, so you just can't, um, can't risk uh, losing those. Yes, um, so I, as we're going on with this, I just wanted to uh, remind the audience that please ask questions or have comments and those questions don't need to be continuous with our questions, but generally questions relating to the topic. You can put questions in the chat or if you're on Facebook, you can um, put questions in the comments section. So we have one question, Janet, do you want to, shall we yeah. take a question uh -huh. from so the from chat? Sutherland, how do you think the issue of self-censorship presents itself for curators in smaller institutions? Are they more free or less accountable in your experiences? And second question, how well do you think UK museums engage with social politics? So Osge, do you want to um, deal with the first part of the question? Or anybody, I think, you know, everybody here has worked in uh, sure. smaller uh -huh. institutions as well. I could leave it to, to the other speakers because um, I believe um, I was able to um, express my position about yeah. that. All right. I, would, I would always think that with the, the smaller scale organizations, the, the conversations are always more intimate and the, the things that we are risking uh, they are different from the, the large scale museum, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Candace, um, you had uh, an experience that wasn't ideal in smaller institutions. Um, I actually disagree. I think that if, if that conversation had happened or if that exhibition had happened at the institution that I worked at instead of outside of the institution. Um, I think that the that it would have with, withstood the criticism and there would have been conversation, but the also because it was a private museum. So it the nature of the museum, it was less accountable um, or it could take greater risks depending. Sorry, I muted myself, um, depending on how you look at it. And I mean, when you're working with a big institution like the National Gallery of South Africa, um, I mentioned in the text that we had to defer all communications to their communication department. So we, we lost, we gave away our voice in that process and um, we were told not to speak. As, so it was self-censorship and censorship that we experienced. Um, and I think that it would have been a completely different experience if it hadn't happened there. Anybody else want to speak to that question? I think in terms of the second part of the question, go ahead, quite sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I think smaller institutions, I wanna answer two questions at the same time. I mean, these issues are in motion. This is work in progress. This is not a static uh, uh, environment where a decision uh, is a yes and a no in front of a um, still picture. This is work in progress. And these challenges, you know, um, fluctuate. And the pressures come from different sides, but not at the same time and not in the same amount and different times everything almost seems to you know kind of change so smaller institutions in this case are more flexible the problem with bigger institutions is that they're not flexible 
And in order for them to change, it is a long chain and the, and the repercussions on the budgets and I don't know what uh, is huge. While in smaller institutions, they're malleable and they can, they can maneuver. And that's why they can, uh, as, as uh, Osge said, they can neg negotiate better in such institutions. But yet, of course, we've, we've learned from our experience that this is not always the case. Smaller institutions can. You can an example? Pardon? Um, like your, can you give us an example from your actual experience? There are many examples I can think of. I mean, again, it will be very hard and it'll take a lot of time because I need to ex explain all the context. And the, because it's not a, as again, it's not a like yes and no black and white decisions. These are, uh, um, you take, you need to move in, in one direction, which seems to be a problem for some people or some whatever regulations. And you try to go and negotiate and find allies and partners to help you put pressure on this group that is opposing you in order for them to maybe, you know, quiet down a bit for you to kind of continue the work. Or you find that the environment is, is actually adverse and it's like there are several, you're dealing with several fronts at the same time and hence you need to kind of duck a little bit and, and, and tone down what you actually set up to do. Um, no, maybe I, I, well, I don't want to get into examples because, yeah, I, I tend to speak a lot in this case. And, and, but you get what I mean. I mean, in, in, in general, dealing with smaller institutions was, is much easier in these circumstances than when it comes to bigger institutions where, you know, this heavy machine needs to kind of be disrupted yeah. and, and, and uh, uh, re-sync with another decision. And that, that takes a lot of time and money. I just wanted to say something very shortly about this. I don't, I would disagree that it has to do with size. I think it has to do with curatorial autonomy. Um, maybe larger scale, scale ex, um, institutions are more prone to less uh, curatorial autonomy, but I think it's, it's, it has to do with the internal political dynamics and uh, the integrity of the curatorial and whoever they're working with, but like the more technical team, let's say, and whether they're granted that, um, that power. Who else yeah. has a question? Yeah, true, but I mean, you need to think about where, where in the world you're talking about, in the States, in Colombia, in Saudi Arabia, in Jerusalem, where? And this plays a major, major role in, in these things. You know, you can have decisions that get disrupted by sheer bureaucracy in some places. And in other places, one word from one person will change everything overnight. Sure, and even in different countries, um, you can have different situations. You know, we've had a change of government in 2018, and the current government is, let's just say, it's not pro peace process. So, obviously, the conditions for the people working at the Museum of Memory are very different right now from what they were when I was working there. Um, I just wanted to also um say that for us the issue of representing um perpetrators and responsible parties was it didn't come from any like any specific place and this was something that we discussed with janet many times because it was very hard for me to pinpoint like you know i, I never got a letter nobody called me nobody told me oh what are you doing with perpetrators and responsible parties it sometimes these pressures are not uh, from outside, they don't come from any specific outside source. They're just part of this process of your curatorial integrity. Um, 
So this is just to add complexity to the issue of size, context, timing, the curator. Um, it just, um, I, I agree with Jack that it varies quite a bit, but then we could also probably pinpoint to other, other parts of the complex matrix where these things are happening. Thank you. Okay, so until we get another question from our audience, I'll ask the question um, of when do you know that curatorial self-censorship is ethical? What, oh, here we have one. Okay. Uh, thinking about curators as authors. Okay, so from Sofia Natalia Gonzalez Ayala. Um, how much do you think of your work as curators as a form of authorship? That's really, really interesting. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? That's a really, really interesting question having to do with integrity and authorship and autonomy. Really interesting. Who wants to go first? Hmm? Who wants to um, start with that? I'll try to, I'll try to grapple with that difficult question. Um, actually, Sophia and I have worked together um, and she was part of the project that I've been referring to. Um, so I, I definitely think that for me, um, curatorship is definitely a form of authorship. Whether even when it's part of a uh, process of negotiation with communities. You know, there's, there's, there's this discussion is what, whether the curator is an author or whether he or she is just a mediator. And for me, again, there's no simple answer to this one. It's both, but there's all, for me, at least in my practice, there's the cre creative um, process of finding connections and structures and providing the project and the exhibit with the possibility of engaging audiences in transformative and learning experiences um, that might not be um, there just by collecting, let's say, collecting testimonies. So I think the curator is another voice, another, um, uh, another layer to this complexity but I definitely think he or she is also an author. Anybody else want to add to that? Contradict it? Question it? Um, I guess I prefer to think of curatorship as shared authorship. Um, I can't claim to be you know, the author of any one idea or one exhibition as a story. Um, and I try to collaborate as much as possible in my practice with, with other curators, with artists, and also recognizing that every exhibition is building upon some kind of knowledge that someone else has explored before you. Um, so yeah, and I think like negotiating the relationships with artworks and the meanings that artists bring through their works to any exhibition is even if they are not um, collaborating in person, their voice is still present through the works that are on show. So does that make you then feel um, less does it make you, do you think it makes you more flexible in terms of thinking about how and when you might need to self-censor? What's the relationship between your approach to this idea of authorship and your approach to self-censorship? Yeah, I mean, so I'll speak about my context in South Africa and what what the exhibition Our Lady really made me hyper aware of is that um, the, une the unequal relationships in South Africa between genders, between different racial groups um, means that sometimes as a curator, 
you're not self-censoring, but you're choosing to give your platform to somebody else to rather let them speak, you know, for themselves. I mean, the, the politics of representation in South Africa has been a very contentious and ongoing subject since the end of apartheid. And I don't, I choose not to see that as self-censorship, but rather sharing authorship. Okay, another question um, from Palin Vasaran. What is the impact of naming and shaming of censorship in negotiations? Is it a useful tool for you? Is that a clear question? I like mm -hmm. the... So um, Svetlana, for example, um, you know, uh, you've worked with different organizations. Um, you've worked with CAA, the College Art Association, for example, um, on guidelines. So um, when, uh, but, but also the naming and shaming that might happen in the press when there's censorship. Do you think that that can be useful um, what's the well, naming and shaming mm -hmm. is now in the U.S. the biggest thing, and it's naming and shaming around, um, you know, targeting specific curators and um, basically calling them racist. Uh, there's a lot of naming and shaming in this sense as a way to. Um, it's more like a tactic of censorship. Um, you know, whether you agree with the 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 material whether you, you agree with the goals or not but naming and shaming has a, a tactic to um uh, we also um say well you know n nobody in the art world wants to be especially here wants to be known as a censor so when we call something censorship we are using a tactic to um uh, to scare people into not censoring it's a very um it's an effective tactic it works with the media. Um, yeah, so much I can say about it. It's a useful tool. Uh, it's, a use, it's, it's definitely, I don't know uh, whether it produces nuanced conversations, probably doesn't, uh, but uh, as a tool to get what you want, I find it, um, I find it useful. It works both ways too. Okay from Richard Sandel. In the UK at present, we have a press and media that is hostile to progressive curatorship. How can curators deal with that? Hmm? What do you think? How have you dealt with that in your own contexts? Who would like to speak to this? It is a question about dealing with the press. Yes. Hmm? You, I'm wondering to what extent your experience is dealing directly with the press or is there, do you have uh, PR people that deal with the press or do you as curators, do you deal directly with the press? Where, right. where you are and do you think curators should deal directly with the press? Um, if I may um, speak and answer this question, of course, from the context where I come from, uh, it's very different from the UK and from the West, and we don't have the the press who's interested in art and what happens on the you know the art scene, and um, uh, our you know. Um, Press releases get published as is. Uh, and no one actually from the press is um, is asking questions. Um, they most of the time, uh, if they're uh, if they want to do us a favor, they they uh, will allow us to publish what we've written. Um, in the Gulf, it was a bit different because there it's more commercialized and. And hence, it's the press, be it, um, and, and I'm saying the art 
um, the art press, which is all over the world, uh, basically is uh, somehow uh, linked to how much money you're spending in advertisement and, 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 and these things. And, and so there isn't this, you know, critical press that is following what one is doing and, you know, um, uh, there's a discussion or, uh, or um, uh, a conversation, even a conversation uh, taking place. It's, it's basically more like, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an advertising um, um, medium through which uh, one gets to disseminate the information. And uh, uh, so uh, um, when I read the question, I thought, well, yeah, maybe this, uh, the person asking is, is thinking, uh, Richard, yeah, is asking about the, um, his particular context, but in other places in the world, it works very, very, very differently. Um, but I think that the question might be read also um, more broadly as to reactions, hostility towards progressive curatorship, not only in the media, but as they were, as they're discussing in the chat, also from within organizations and from like larger societal response to um, progressive uh, curatorship. Um, I'm not sure uh, what my um, what the other panelists' experiences uh, have been towards this. Um, I think I've been I consider myself privileged because um, even at the even when I've left uh, institutions that I felt are not open enough for progressive curatorship. I've always, in my context, been able to find other institutions um, that are open towards that uh, sort of curatorship, which deals with the limits of practice and um, wants to sort of learn and evolve. Um, so I think that hostility uh, at least in the context we are living right now, might be more, uh, might be not hostility, but there might, we could read it like the other way around. And it's the question of, we have all these uprises happening and um, all those political and uh, environmental movements that are happening. And so the question here would be, what are curators doing? Um, what are curators, how are curators responding to this? So it would, in my context, it could actually be read the other way around. And do any of you work to um, build relationships with particular individuals in the media so that um, they can understand better what you're doing and help to represent the complexity of your work? Um, uh, so that it's not read in such a black and white kind of way. Um, do you have particular strategies for that? Do you have strategies to um, circumvent working with the media at all um, in, in some of these issues? Um, so how do you think about that? Um, in, in the South African context, the there's not much interest from the general media in art as well as Jack was saying. Um, we have some dedicated art media platforms, um, but our, our Lady, the exhibition actually generated one of the more, uh, one of the bigger media responses from the general news media. Um, and it wasn't so much the nuances of the exhibition that they were interested in or, or many of the criticisms leveled against it. It was the, uh, the drama really <laughs> of um, a high profile artist standing trial for murder. And that's what the media tended to focus on more than you know, anything else in the show. So we also in a context where there are very few spaces for um, progressive curatorship. We have a, a huge uh, commercial 
market in South Africa and the industry is dominated by commercial galleries. And I mean, I don't think that their curatorship is very progressive. And then this is also, I suppose, compounded by the fact that curatorship is still quite a new profession in South Africa. And it's not something that started until sort of 20, 2007, the late, you know, early 2010, when we started having curatorial workshops. We still don't have um, a postgraduate, like a master's curatorial course in South Africa. We only have um, undergraduate level. I think like, I, I think there are many interesting questions here, uh, and we can and we have so many different contexts uh, that we should probably have a conference on that. But I wanted to start kind of wrapping up because we just have five minutes left, and I want to ask everybody one kind of concluding question, which is, um, if you had to give one piece of, of advice to a curator stepping into your particular context. Um, tomorrow or next year, what would that be? Or two pieces of advice. What did you, what's the, the, the most uh, valuable advice that you think people, new curators don't know about that you would give to them? Let's start with Özge. Sure. Um, I guess for me, the, one of the, the main issues is around uh, this assumed neutrality of um, around our positions or the, the impartiality. Um, to me, for instance, I don't believe that there is only one way to take a position. Um, I was thinking of one of my mentors, Vasif Korten, who actually wrote um, that one of the, the, the most amazing contributions to public thinking were fermented, tested, and negotiated away from the gaze of the order and the populist. And we spoke about this with him as well. This fermentation idea is quite an interesting one because we're speaking about the closed environment, which is not necessarily the first thing that comes to our mind when we think of curating and art institutions because these are often defined by exhibition making, so by being open. Um, so I believe that one of the interesting questions that we are dealing today is that um, how do we create tools for safe spaces where research and discourse can develop as well? So curating, taking curating beyond exhibition making. Um, if the, the pressures are high, if the pressures are um, getting too much, how do we actually um, move away from the, the openness and the, the exhibitionary output or the focus on that and also think about curating as a tool to, to create social relationships. Um, and probably that question is one of the, the main questions that I've been dealing with recently in Hong Kong as well, going back to, to the first question that Janet asked me. So creating a platform for, that is not an exhibition necessarily platform uh, but a platform where a ferment of ideas could happen. And exactly. they exist some of those, no? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jack, your advice? Yeah, I mean, one, one piece of advice, or at least the thing that made more sense to me over the years, are the projects and ideas that can find root in um, in a particular context and can you know uh, grow and bear fruit on the long term uh, rather than uh, working on you know instantaneous um, uh, production of uh, projects and ideas and exhibitions and you know uh, and 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 catering to whatever funder or whatever program the institution is is actually um, uh, drawing uh, the, to me that that would that is the most satisfying thing that I did in my life and that I saw on the long run really uh, makes sense and um, uh, it was worth the effort. 
because you're both looking forward towards uh, towards creating a social space uh, rather than creating uh, like the old model of creating exhibitions. Absolutely, um, absolutely. But not yeah. not only social in the context of social, because as Uzge said, it's a, 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 it's a space. It's uh, it's resources. It's knowledge. Uh, it's a whole network of connections, and all of these um uh, come into play uh um and uh for an artist's practice and for an artist uh, to help an artist build a career and and work on the long term uh you need those things so i think the this curatorial relationship with the artist and the work that is being done in a particular place and as i said the context uh um needs to be built over this kind of long you know, uh, working progress type of um, uh, relationship. And that's why I said before, Svetlana, it's, it's, uh, it's in motion. And that's why these, the, all these questions are, are uh, revolving and, and, and coming and going and, uh, at different uh, uh, magnitudes and at different uh, weights. So um, that would be my, you know, piece of advice: is to kind of think more of, of how what uh, what one wants to do makes sense on the long term, and how does it really make the the impact. And as many of you said in your in your papers, um, those connections, those networks, are absolutely essential. Then, as you face these pressures, that that can be one of the most helpful things that you have as you face these pressures of self-censorship, because isolation can be the most difficult thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Partnerships and yeah. creating networks of partnerships is, is, a sure, is an assurance of uh, some sort of, uh, of, uh, of um, you know, a, a protective environment that can help you kind of move forward without all the needing to deal with everything at the same time, all the time. Yeah, Christina, your piece of advice. Um, I summed it up as the curatorial is political. Um, going back to that, to the lessons that we've learned from social movements and feminism. And um, this is why we end up talking about all of these issues of self-censorship and censorship because our practice cannot be cut off from the political. And um, if I can give any sort of very humble advice towards this is um, how, can as, how can we continue to redefine the practice? Um, there's a Mexican curator um, called Cuauhtémoc Medina, and he says that curating is not a discipline, uh, it's not a profession, it's more like a vocation. And so um, our job is to continue to challenge the norms, to question the limits of practice, to continuously reinvent it. As Osge was saying, it's now about our, uh, the state of the world right now maybe le needs led less less exhibitions and more relationships. Um, so that would be my piece of advice. I think everybody's on the same, uh, I think everybody agrees so far. So, uh, this. And um, Candace? Yeah, um, I think it's important to, to be self-reflective, um, as Osge says, to be aware of and acknowledge your position. Um, when you encounter challenges or ethical dilemmas or if something makes you feel uncomfortable or afraid even to have open and transparent conversations with your peers colleagues people who have opposite different opinions to you even um, not to be afraid to have those conversations with the audience as well through the interpretation of your work um, and also to be open to changing your position through the course of curating an exhibition or the course of your career. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you so much. 
And um, I think we're out of time. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, we're continuing this conversation for sure. Thank you all so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.